Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the beautiful Biscayne Bay campus of Florida International University. Uh, my name is Raul Reyes, and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication here at FIU. And it's my honor today to be hosting the Hearst Distinguished Lecture Series, and in particular, to welcome Sri Srinivasan, the first Chief Digital Officer of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. I'd also like to welcome the journalists visiting from Botswana today under the auspices of the U.S. State Department's International Visitor Leadership Program. As the dean of our school, it's my responsibility to not only ensure that we are delivering the very best education to our students today, but that we'll continue to do so in years to come. That means not only adhering to the tradition of excellence that our school is no, known for, but also trying to prepare all of you for the changes and unknowns that are shaking up our industries. The rise of digital first practices and the importance of social media today is undeniable. These new media are allowing businesses and professionals to connect with their audience in unprecedented ways. In fact, they are tearing down the boundaries between consumers and businesses. How will this affect the profession landscape of tomorrow? How can our students best position you, best position yourselves, not only to adapt, but to lead in these changes? These are tough questions, and I don't think anybody has a definitive answer. There are some professionals, however, who are well positioned to provide great insight into what's coming up, and Sri is one such individual. Sri is the very first chief digital officer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where he leads a 70, 70, 70 person world class team in areas such as digital, social, mobile, video, apps, interactives, data, and more. He and his team just launched the Met's flagship iOS app, which was named the best new app by Apple, a must-have app by Design Sponge, and an app of the week by iLounge. He's bringing a comprehensive digital approach to opening the mat to the public, and his app is but one of the many ways he's doing so. His social media team was named one of the most influential on Twitter. Their Facebook has over 1.2 million likes, their Instagram account won a Webby Award in the social, arts, and culture category. Before earning such accolades at the Met, Shri was a full-time professor at Columbia's journalism school for over 20 years. In 2009, he was named one of Ad Age, Age's 25 media people to follow on Twitter. In 2010, he was named one of the pointers 35 most influential people in social media, and in 2014, he was named one of the most influential chief digital officers by the CDO club. All this is to say that Sri has a wealth of knowledge, insight, and experience to share with us here today, and to help us answer those pressing questions about how to embrace the tools and new media of the 21st century. I'm honored to welcome him to the stage. Please join me, welcome Shri to FIU. Oh, um, I'm asking, I mean, you're being asked to uh, put your phones on silent, please, uh, if everybody can do that. Uh, thank you very much, Dean. That was a very, very generous introduction. I'm, I'm so excited to be here at FIU and the beautiful campus here. Uh, when I was invited to come, I, the invitation came very strategically in January to come speak in Miami. And you've heard about the horror stories in New York. And so I didn't even hesitate whenever, as soon as I could make the schedule work, I, I said yes. And um, I am delighted to spend the next hour or so talking about digital media with you and with folks who are watching online. What we'll do is talk about some of the lessons I have learned at the Met 
and then open it up to questions and give you a chance to really dig in as much as you'd like. And then afterwards, if we, if we have some uh, time after, I'm happy to also, in smaller groups, talk to all of you. I'm trying to do something different at this session, and that is not present from this computer or from an iPad, which is what all the cool kids do today, but I'm going to present to you today from my iPhone. And partly this is to kind of make the point that we're in a very digital world. And the digital world is now more mobile than any, any other time. So this is the point to say, we're going to talk a lot about mobile, so let's work in mobile itself. And what I'm going to do is just to show you that I'm actually working from this. I'm going to first go in to my phone and take a nice picture of all of you good-looking people. There you go. All right, I document that. And then I'm going to just go look at the photograph again. And let's see here. If I can, oh, there you go. Uh, turn that around. This is kind of fun with, you know, you know, when you're pioneering something, you can always get in trouble, right? But let's look at this photograph right here. Some of you know that I work at the Met, and the Met is all about unearthing and maintaining and keeping great treasures from the past. And you're all lucky that you have such a treasure here at the uh, here at FIU, and that's Neil Reisner, my friend and uh, colleague. And you can think about how many photographs I have in my collection, thousands and thousands of photographs, but I was able to pull this wonderful photo up, and um, Neil's sitting there very embarrassed, and that's me behind, I don't know what you're meant to be embarrassed about, that's me behind you, and look at the hair I used to have, right? Just look at that. Though your hair is pretty good then and pretty good now. But thank you, Neil, for inviting me, and thank you for having me here. We took a class together in spreadsheets in the prehistoric days of 1993, and here we are now in a world where everybody learns how to do spreadsheets and PowerPoint and all that stuff. The world has definitely, definitely changed. So let's go back to our presentation. For those of you watching online or who are here, I have already tweeted out my slides. So if you go to the at Sri Twitter account, you'll find that the slides are already there. So if you'd like to leave right now, you're welcome to do so. I will not take any, I uh, will not be upset in any way. So um, the, the, the slides, actually the, the right hashtag, the right link for the slides is bit.ly slash C, just C, uh, sorry, SJMC Hearst. You don't even need the three. So just bit.ly slash SJMC Hearst will get you to the slides. I'll also give you my contact information, which is at Sri on Twitter, at SriNet on Instagram, and my email is Sri at Sri.net. And the first lesson there is that it's not Sri.com. Sri.com is a chain of motels in Florida. So that's sort of your cyber identity is extremely important. One of the things I like to tell everybody who is in a room like this is I tell them three letters, A, B, C. Always be charging your phone, which I hope you're doing. How many of you are charging your phone right now? Very few people, all right? You should be thinking about charging your phone either with an extra case or a battery pack uh, because your social media can only happen if you have a working device. So you always want to be thinking about how you uh, charge your device. Another ABC is always be connecting. And I tell people that you should be connecting when you don't need people so that they're there when you need them. So this is a good opportunity for you to reach out to me on Twitter, at Sri, on Instagram, at SriNet, on LinkedIn. And let's look around. How many of you are on LinkedIn? Raise your hand. How many of you know what you're doing on LinkedIn? Oh, the hands start falling, right? Yeah, we, uh, people turn into kind of Indian dancers. They're not sure, maybe, I've heard of LinkedIn. People, I, I believe that LinkedIn is the most underused and underappreciated social network of them all. And you have to use LinkedIn now when you don't need it so that it's there when you need it. I tell people it's too late to use LinkedIn when your company starts having layoffs and it's too late when you're about to graduate because you don't know the language, the etiquette, and the way to use it. So practice on it now if you can, and it will help you. Because what happens is you go on there and then you become desperate, and desperation does not work on LinkedIn and doesn't work on eHarmony or JDate, <laughs> but I hear that it does work on Tinder, I hear. 
And the third ABC is always be collecting. And what I mean by that is be collecting by using your cameras, using your phones as a recording device in addition to your notebooks. You should have great notebooks, but you should also use your camera. So if you see something interesting up here, just take a picture of it, and then you'll have all the slides and everything else that we're talking about. What happens is if you take a picture of a single slide, you will have a chance of reading it again and maybe accessing it. On the other hand, if you only depend on the slide deck that someone gives you, you'll never look at it. I have 20, 30 slides. You'll never look at them again. So if you go onto my Twitter account and hit retweet, you're sharing out the slides with everybody you know. So what I'm going to do is share with you some lessons I've learned over the last year, and we'll try to do it in about 30 minutes, and then get you a chance to ask some great questions, and we have a, a wonderful moderator who will join me in a little while. And when people ask me what it is that I do at, uh, at the Met, I talk about connecting the physical and the digital the in-person and the online. And I believe the future of all business is making that, th those sets of connections, the in-person and the online. We want you to have such a great experience online with the Met that you'll want to come and look at us in person. And while you're there, you have such a great experience in person that you want to come and stay connected to us online. And that's that virtuous circle we need to make. And another way I think of my job is it's to tell a million plus stories about our million plus pieces of art to a billion plus people. First lesson, if your boss does not ask you for metrics, do not give him metrics, especially if they start with one billion in there somewhere. So that was my mistake. So now whenever Tom Campbell sees me, he can say, yo, where's my billion people? So that was a mistake for, uh, on my part. Well, if you're going to talk about the physical, I have to start by showing you the outside of the Met. And if you haven't been in a while, how many of you have been to the Metropolitan Museum? A lot of you. Thank you. My children eat when you go to the Met, so thank you. Every time you visit the Met, my children eat online or in person. Every time you tweet or go on Instagram, my children eat. So please, please keep doing that. You should know that I was, um, as you heard earlier, I was 21 years at Columbia. I loved what I did at Columbia. I loved being among journalists, being a journalism professor. And I, I left um, to work at the Met because I grew up near the Met. And I had <clears throat> what I call a 30-year one-way love affair with the Met. And if you have someone who loves you or who you love for 30 years and she calls you, you have to take the call. And then with your wife's permission, carry on which is what I did and we did and that's what I, I left behind full free tuition for my children at Columbia, which is kind of scary. And it gets worse than that. It's half tuition anywhere in the world and my twins are only 11 now. I also gave up, uh, it's also pre-tax dollars. So any tax lawyers in the room know that's a lot of money I left behind. So one of the things I'm hoping to do today is to not just make you think about the Met, but all museums. I hope you'll all turn into better museum goers than you are today. Even if you worked at a museum, you don't go to enough museums. So that's part of my uh, pitch to you today is let's go to the great museums of Miami and to New York and everywhere else. And this is our new facade that's just, not the facade, the plaza that's just been redone at the Met. And the pictures of the Met's front are taken at a trustee's home across the way on Fifth Avenue. And this is a photograph that was taken on an iPhone 5S by Eileen Travell, who is one of our photographers. We have 12 full-time photographers at the Met, and she took this picture. And one of the lessons here is that in a world where everybody is a photographer, you can stand taller if you're a trained photographer. People will ask me all the time, when I ran admissions at Columbia, they say, how can you charge Ivy League prices to, uh, for journalism, an industry that's dying? And A, the industry is not dying. It is morphing, it's changing before our eyes, but it is not dying. There's more journalism being created and consumed than ever before. There's more demand for the skills of a journalist than ever before. What we have to find is the right balance of the business aspects of, of journalism. But what I used to say is, at a time when everybody's a photographer, the trained photographer stands taller. In a time when everybody's a publisher, the trained writer stands taller. And that's why I could go to bed at night 
uh, thinking about journalism, even though there's so much um, turmoil in journalism uh, over these years. So look at this photograph. Now, if I had taken this picture with an iPhone, it would not look anywhere as good as this. So the importance is that your own background, your own expertise does matter, and it's a point I will return to in a while. When you look at the Met during the day, you also have to look at it at night, and you can see how beautiful it is. One of the things that I have learned in the last few years is this from Les Hinton. And Les Hinton is a, a publisher, former publisher of the Wall Street Journal, and he has this wonderful line where he says, the scarcest resource of the 21st century is human attention. And everything we do as organizations, as schools, as individuals should be about getting people's attention. If you have children in your life, that's all they want is your attention. So they are trained to understand the importance of attention. What more can we do to get attention to the things we're doing is one of the things that we will learn and discuss today. And by the way, if I mention anyone in person, you might want to have some fun and tweet at them and say, hey, at Les Hinton, we're talking about you. And Les, who's probably in Manhattan right now, where it's 35 degrees, you can bring him right into sunny Miami at whatever it is, 75 degrees or uh, whatever it is today. So what does a chief digital officer do at a museum? As you heard, we already discussed, you heard from the dean that we have a 70-person um, uh, department. I work very closely with our CTO. So C CDO and CTO are two different jobs. The CTO, Jeff Spar, and I work very closely together about, he does the infrastructure, the networking, the computers, the Wi-Fi, all the guts of the operation. And without him, there would be, and his team, there would be nothing that we could do on the digital side. The CDO and our team, we work on all the audience-facing digital projects at the museum. So whether it's an in-gallery in interactive or something you see online. We doubled our social media team to two people in the last two years. I also call the CDO the chief listening officer. And that's really important because someone in the company has to be listening for good ideas and new ideas. But in a place like the Met, that's a lot of listening. The Met is the largest encyclopedic museum in the world, which means it's, uh, it has the largest it's the largest museum that has the most cultures represented. We have 5,000 years of human creativity represented in one institution. And we're the largest tourist attraction in New York. We have about 2 million square feet of space, 45 special exhibitions, and you see some of these numbers on people we are reaching. Here are some of the things I've learned. Number one is that technology and art have gone hand in hand for thousands of years. Digital media did not start at the Met with the creation of digital media. It, technology has been part of the Met and art for so long. And I'm going to show you here, if I can just zoom in here, this is a computer punch card that some of the older folks in the room will recognize. And this is the punch card specifically of a Georgia O'Keeffe. And you might recognize this painting. Some of you recognize this painting, right? This beautiful cow skull. And this is what it uh, was, this is how it was represented at the Met through the punch card on the left. We went back and looked at the curator's minutes from 1967, almost, you know, you can see almost an anniversary today. And it's, it talks about how the use of a computer is being seriously considered by the Met. And Mr. Watson of IBM has been instrumental in these recent discussions. Who is Mr. Watson of IBM? Anybody know? The founder of IBM. So it would be sort of like Mark Zuckerberg coming to the Met and saying, I have this new service. It's called Facebook. What do you think of it? Is it a useful, th would you like to try it? And then we found this quote. Dr. So-and-so doubts a computer would be a time-saving device. It's kind of fun. So computers have been around for a long time. Just would we use it? How would we use it? These are the things that we've kind of have been trying to work out over the years. The only reason you are able to see any art in any museum is because the artist used the right tools at the right time, the right canvas, the right brick and mortar, whatever it is, the right sculpture, everything to be able to tell the, uh, his or her story. And that's why we have that today. 
I've learned that you've got to get the word out and it won't be easy. Anyone recognize this man? Anyone? He's, I call him one of the world's most influential, unelected people, maybe top 10 list. His name is Sal Khan from Khan Academy. And Khan Academy is changing education. And again, if you want to tweet at him, you could just say, at Khan Academy, we're talking about you down here in Miami. Bring him here from California. And Sal uh, and, uh, and the Met, we're doing a project together. We're doing a pilot project. The way you get things done at a big institution is to call it a pilot project. And sometimes I feel we have more pilots than JetBlue. And he said to me that the vast majority of people who can benefit from our free service whose lives I can change tonight, whose grandkids' lives I can change tonight, have never heard of Khan Academy and will never hear of Khan Academy. So think about all of you in whatever business you're in, whatever you'd like to sell or tell people about. If people won't accept free education, what will they accept? And so instead of depressing me, that really motivated me to say, everything we do, we have to tell people about it. We have to be better about telling people about it than we ever have. Another thing I learned, you never know where good ideas come from. At the Met, we have 6.2 million visitors, as you know, and we don't collect email addresses from them, or we didn't. And the boss said, hey, why don't we collect email addresses from folks? And I thought it was a terrible idea. Even if it was absolutely low-key, optional, I believe Wi-Fi should be free and have no barriers. But it was the boss suggesting this, so with, with holding my nose, we decided to do the project, and we launched this form. It's kind of innocuous form. I said it's a bad idea because it should be like the air. It should be free. I said we'd get 10 people signing up a day. Nine of them would be Mickey Mouse at DonaldDuck.com. Instead, after we launched this, in less than a year, we've had 150,000 non-duplicate valid email addresses that have come with higher CTRs or click-through rates and open rates than our members. For those of you in marketing, those things mean something. For the rest of you, you don't know, it doesn't matter. But CTR or click-through rate is really important. So the, the, when you hear somebody say you never know where a good idea comes from, it's usually about the intern who had a good idea. It can also be the boss. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to tell you about my boss and how he is now on Instagram. And that's his Instagram handle. I hope you'll follow him. BuzzFeed did a story on Thursday, said 23 art world Instagrams every art lover should follow. And he was on there along with the Met Photo Studio account. So he's Thomas Campbell on Instagram. And Tom, when he wanted to be on social, we put him on Instagram and not on Twitter. And the reason, people always guess the reason, is because we're a museum and so there are visuals. That is a reason, but not the reason. The real reason is there's much less drama on Instagram. <laughs> much less drama. On Twitter, there's so much drama and you can get in trouble easily. And he's doing such a beautiful job on Instagram that people ask me if I'm posting for him or our social media team is. It's all the magic of his eyes, his fingers, and his iPhone 4S. He's now recently got a 6. So he is now going to have even better pictures. So do follow him. Let's see if we can get him a few dozen followers from here in Miami right now, if you will follow him. And remember, people are expecting tweets from all of you, so please use the hashtag SJMCHurst and tell people if there's anything interesting you see, or even anything bad you see, or waste of time you see, no problem. I've also learned that storytelling counts, that the future of all business is storytelling along with that connection of the physical and the digital, and you should all be doing all you can to hone your storytelling skills. I'm not going to show you this video, but you can go online and find a, seg uh, a series we did called 82nd and 5th, that's 82nd Street, and Fifth Avenue is the address of the Met, as many of you know. And we did 100 videos of curators talking about their 100 favorite pieces of art, two minutes each. And to get experts to talk for two minutes is very difficult. But they have so much passion that we were able to bottle it in these two two-minute videos that you can see online or in an iPad app. And this particular piece, I hope, is intriguing just from the title. 
It's called the iPhone of ancient Rome. And I hope you'll go and look at it and tell me what you think. Later this week, we're launching a new series called The Artist Project, which are a hundred of the most successful, interesting, uh, and sometimes, in some cases young and not yet successful, but will be successful artists, contemporary artists, talking about the Met and their art. Think about ways in which you can tell stories about your work, and you will be successful in today's media world. I've also learned that we all have to be smarter about social media. And we have very active social media accounts, as you can see. But I do want to tell you that these raw numbers don't matter. On social media, it's not who follows you that matters. It's who follows who follows you that matters. So you're looking not for the raw count of followers, but who are the influential people following you. And you want to build up that number more than anything else. It's very easy to, people ask me all the time, how do I get more followers? You can buy 100,000 followers for $200. Lots of politicians do that. Please never do that because there are lots of tools like status people and other things that can show you how many fake followers somebody has. So please don't do that yourself. You want engaged followers, people who really care about you and your work and want to connect with you. And so while these numbers are interesting, they're also just the start. If you go all the way to the bottom, you can tell that the YouTube account is badly optimized at the Met, that we have a lot of work to do. How can you tell? Because we only have 15 million views. That is nothing. There are teenage girls who have hundreds of millions of views. Uh, I was shocked to learn that among the most popular people on, social, on, on YouTube are folks who do the following. Men who play video games and other men watch them play video games. And women and, and girls who watch other girls show you what they shopped for at the mall or makeup tips. And I, I, I believe, you may know there's a service called Twitch that Amazon bought for a billion dollars. And what is it? Just boys watching other boys play video games. And when I was little, my mom would come in and say, son, get out, stop playing video games. I'm worried that I might come in one day and say to my son, son, please play video games. Is a watching other people play. When I was growing up, <laughs> when I was growing up, one of the key things you wanted in video games was the cheat code. You guys familiar with this? The cheat code was really important. Today, my kids are on Minecraft. They don't want the cheat codes. They want to hack and understand, hack in a good way, how to do it. They want to watch the steps. They want instructions. They don't want to cheat. It's unbelievable change in how people are thinking and using digital. So we've got a lot of work to do in YouTube and some of these other accounts as well. But what, if you are interested in social media, I have for you in my presentation, at the end of my presentation, 50 slides, or not 50, several dozen slides of our social media strategy. So you can get it for each account, how we do social media on each of these platforms. So please take a look. Again, you can find my slides are linked directly on my Twitter account because uh, I tweeted them uh, just before we started. By the way, one thing I'll just show you about Flickr that might surprise you. We discovered that on Flickr, we did an analysis of our Flickr account, millions of photographs, almost zero selfies. Because people on, on Flickr, what do they think of themselves? As photographers, so they will never use a selfie. Instagram, full of selfies. I banned, we banned at the Met, the selfie stick. I'm sorry to tell you that. And <laughs> thank you. And I said to everybody, I am pro-selfie, just not pro-selfie stick. And there is a difference. And if you want tips on how to take a selfie without a selfie stick, I'm happy to show you. Here's the dirty secret of social media. And you might want to take a photograph of this and share it with your friends. People who take a picture and post this online, they say they get more reaction out of this than almost anything, ironically. Almost everyone will miss almost everything you do on social media. But this is true about anything. It's true about television. It's true about, um, it's true about um, newspapers. It's true because there's so much content out there. We talked about YouTube a minute ago. There was a time when YouTube hit 24 hours of video uploaded every minute onto YouTube. Now it's 300 hours uploaded every minute. So if you want 
something to be top secret, just put it on YouTube. Nobody will see it. That's the safe thing. But there is a second part of this. Are you ready? Right? You got it, right? And so you have to think about this, that when you want something to be seen by everybody, nobody will see it. When you don't want it seen by everybody, everybody will see it. And I notice this when I make a mistake on Twitter, which is three times a week. I have friends who will retweet, favorite things, my mistakes, but will never touch any of the good things I send all, year, all week. So I'm compiling all of them, and they're going to get something one day. I don't know what, but they're going to get something. When people ask me, what have you achieved in, all, in, in two, month, two years at the Met, I say very little, about this much. Every exhibition at the Met now has a hashtag. And that's not because we're some geniuses. It's because our audience was standing there in our exhibition saying, what is the hashtag? What is the hashtag? So you have to think about how you can use these in whatever else you're doing. I love this quote from Erica Anderson, who you should follow now when you don't need her. And she works at Twitter, and she says, if you are good in real life, you can be great on Twitter. I like that. I've taken it further. What about all of you at FIU? You're not good in real life. You're great in real life. So if you're great in real life, you can be awesome on social media, is what I want you to remember. And I learned that from Roger Ebert, as you can see there. Roger Ebert, if you, if you click on my, on my presentation and you click on that link, you'll find an article I wrote about five social media lessons from Roger Ebert. And Roger, by the way, was 65 when he discovered Twitter, and it tells you it's not about age, it's about attitude and what you do. No point having someone from the Met if I don't show you some art. And here is the Temple of Dendur. And I don't know if you recognize the family in the bottom here. Uh, oops, sorry, let me just go back. Uh, everybody recognize this family? That's the Seinfeld family, and Jesse Seinfeld is huge on social media. She's Jess Seinfeld on Instagram, maybe same on Twitter, and that's the family. And that's one of the things that's changed. People were so worried about paparazzis that what did they do? They became their own paparazzi. They have cutting out the middleman, middle woman, by doing their own family photographs and things like that. It's a new world, as, as we all know. We also learned that the cultural landscape is shifting really fast. And why is this important to know for all of us is people who are in media need to understand this. Even though we don't think of ourselves in the cultural space necessarily, you are in the cultural space, and the zeitgeist is really important. So if people are overstimulated, hyperconnected, culturally promiscuous, that word is important, that first word is important, cynical and self-focused, that sounds all bad, but that last attribute is really useful, that they are curious. And how can we jump on that? And if you want to learn about the cultural aspects in the, of the world today, I urge you to read the Culture Track report from La Placa Cohen, which is an ad agency. You just click on that in my presentation, and you will get the full report. Every two years, they do the definitive study on this topic. Another art break. Here's a beach, but you're not interested in that. I've also learned that everyone wants a peek behind the scenes. And what does that mean? That means that you have to give people a chance to understand what's happening as part of your storytelling. And this is a very quick example of a painting that was, that was made in the 1700s and was hanging, uh, was, was hanging in Paris, in 1600s, I'm sorry, hanging in Paris, and then went to an English castle. And the Met eventually bought this, and you can see part of the reason why nobody, w people were worried about this is you see that crease across the top? People were, didn't want it because of that crease or were worried about the crease. So we have 100 curators and 100 conservators and scientists who can work on these things to improve them. And so two of our most senior folks, the head of European painting, Keith Christensen, and our head of painting conservation, Mike Gallagher, started blogging, tweeting, uh, sharing all the content that they were doing there and all the work. And you can see that crease right there. So we started to embrace the crease instead of running away from it. And here you see uh, Michael Gallagher using a single swab and a few drops of solvent to clean the baby's toes. And we posted all this on Facebook, on Twitter, etc. We've had more than a million views of a painting that doesn't exist for the public yet. 
And that's what you want to do. Start building your audience by getting information out about it. And I hope you'll all come to see this in a few weeks when it opens at the Met. Please come and look for it. It's called the Yabach Painting, J-A-B-A-C-H. That's the name of the family. And the painter is Charles Lebrun, L-E-B-R-U-N. As I told you, mobile is really important. And we used three attributes for building our mobile app. And there's the following, simple, useful, delightful. And I would urge you to think about every project you do. Is there any reason it shouldn't be simple, useful, delightful? You may want to. As I, when I came to the Met, I wanted to put the entire museum in your pocket. Like, that was my goal, to put the entire museum in your pocket. But what happens when you put the entire museum in your pocket? When your son or daughter wants to play Angry Birds, what's the first thing they delete? Your museum app, right? So you have to very carefully think about how and when and where you build your apps and what you put in it. And these are some of the names of the people who did the work with me. And we worked with a company from Portland called Instrument to build this together. These are some of the apps that I use as touchstones when thinking about mobile. What is the app at the bottom? Does anyone know? Close. It is the New York Times. What is the name of this app? Anybody else? It's called the NYT Now app. And this is what I check multiple times a day. It's only 30% of the New York Times, but it's the right 30%. And for a paper of record, as the New York Times like to call itself, it does something amazing. It links out to other stories from around the web. It has the confidence to say, this is good, but I'm going to show you other people's stuff also. And that is key to being successful today digitally, that you don't want everything to be just about you. You're willing to open up and talk about other people. Think about Google. Before Google, Google came around, the big networks uh, that did search engine work was what? Things like Yahoo and uh, Alta Vista and Dogpile. I used to do workshops like this about Google and say there's this new thing called Google. You've got to try it out. And journalists would say, eh, I like Dogpile. They preferred something called Dogpile over something called Google. And why? Because they were already comfortable. And that's another lesson for us is that we should use the tools that we're comfortable with, but we should also be open to new ideas. Earlier today, I tweeted a photograph and a quote from the former public, uh, administrator of the Pulitzer Prizes, Sig Gisler, who said, keep your minds open, but don't let your brain fall out. Keep your mind open, but don't let your brain fall out. I think that's good advice. And this idea that you can create things and then link out, be confident. So what did Google do? I'm sorry. So Google came in and said they had this I'm feeling lucky button that almost nobody uses today, right? But that was one of the reasons that Google was so attractive was you, w it w you would like, if you trust, you know, if you love somebody, set them free. And what happens is you'd head out, but they knew you would come back. You'll never forget who showed you the way. Even if they, you know, they're not guiding you every way, but they show you the way, that's really important. So for something for us to think about, and that's one of the principles of this particular app. Another one I love on here is TripIt. Anybody here using TripIt? One, two, three. I don't know how anybody travels without TripIt. Thank you for using it. TripIt is not a travel booking site. It's a travel arranging site. It takes all, you know, you get your email from your hotel, email from your uh, airline, and it's all in this tiny font. You just forward those emails to plans at tripit.com, and it makes this beautiful looking agenda of what your day is and where to be. And in big letters, it says, this is the boarding time, and that's very useful. And it's a free tool. I, I pay the extra just because I appreciate them so much. By the way, as a journalist, I should tell you, I make no money from anything I'm talking about, except the Met. Moves. Anybody here wearing a Fitbit or any kind of measuring? One person? Anybody else? Two. Okay. So this is one of the things, because there's so much media hype, you might think everybody's wearing these uh, Fitbit, Nike fuel band, but in a room of uh, s you know, several dozen people, there's only two people using it. So it tells you that the hype may not actually connect with what's reality at all times. What Moves is a free app on your phone that does basically some of what the more fancy Fitbit type things do, and it calculates your steps. And you know you have to walk 10,000 steps a day just to maintain your weight. And so I've been using that, and uh, I find it very, very uh, useful. 
Another app I love is called Dark Sky. Anybody using that? Dark Sky is an app about the weather. And you'll say, well, there are a thousand weather apps. Why do I need another one? This tells you only one thing. Is it going to rain where you're standing in the next hour or not? <laughs> right? You know this internet meme, you had one job, right? You had one job. Your one job is to tell you, uh, is it raining or not? So in New York, it's very helpful. And I'm sure in Miami, where it rains on and off, it's very, very helpful. It started as a Kickstarter campaign. And, and uh, one of the things that, are, one of the lessons from it is how good, not just how good it works or how well it works, but how good it looks. And that's one of the things we've also learned is that form and function have to go together. Form and function, not just it works really well, so let's just throw it out there. Get it as beautifully looking and as beautifully working as you can. So those are some apps. Let's take a second here and shout out some apps that you think people should know. Wait, okay, Waze, W-A-Z-E, which was a small startup and was bought for a billion dollars, uh, an Israeli startup. Yes, go ahead. Meerkat. Okay, anybody meerkatting us today? Somebody, nobody? You can still start. It's not too late. So Meerkat is an app that allows you to shoot video live right now, and you can, you, you know, you can send it around the world. You can live stream into Twitter. Thank you. That's the, sh that's the easiest way to explain it. There are other tools that do this. There's a tool from Spain called UpClose that I'm experimenting with. What, one of the things I like to see is, are there archives also of, of these tools? There's Bamboozer is another one. People were using it in Pakistan during a series of uh, big time protests uh, against the Taliban. They were using Bamboozer to live broadcast from the scene. And so yeah, I think it's important to have both the live aspect, but also the archived aspect as well. Let's get a couple of other apps in. Anybody? Pocket. Pocket is great, especially for journalist media people, because it becomes a place to store all these articles that you're not reading. You just get them, and you put them in Pocket, and you think you might read them later. Someone else had a suggestion? Venmo. Venmo is a payment service, correct? There are so many, just like there are weather apps, there's so many ways to pay, right? Apple Pay, Square. Uh, there's a new service coming out, I forget what it's called, where you can just send by email. You can just write an email to somebody and send cash to them. So I, I'm sorry? Google Wallet does that, yeah. So by the way, I accept payment on all those platforms. So please sign up and just send me cash. What else, any other apps? Come on. One password, One password. thank you, one password. Very important app, because what it does, it remembers all your passwords through a master password. And it, I think it has a mobile app also, not just the computer, not this desktop. Wow, look at that. You, uh, you've got a great tip there to use one password. Let's get some more. Somebody said Lyft. So, Ift, oh, I-F-T-T-T-T-T-T, which is if this, then that. It's something that I wasn't recommending earlier to people. We have to, uh, we have to look at the picture of Neil again. <laughs> but let's just um, go on here and just let me just show you what's on, you know, it's like what's, on your, what's in your wallet. Let's see what's on my iPhone. Um, here is Ift, I-F, it's now just called If. They've kind of changed their name, their branding. And what it does is it was so geeky that I never talked about it to people. But now it's a lot easier to use. Basically, what you can do is if something happens on the internet, then you can trigger something else on the internet. If you, uh, every time you get an email from somebody, you can get a special alert. Every time you, something happens here, something can happen there. There is something called the Hue, H-U-E light bulb from Philips, which is an internet light bulb. And I had to buy this and install it in my home, and my wife was very upset. Uh, but basically what happens is you can control the lights from your phone and then when my mom emails me, the color change, it blinks different colors. Uh, and when your team scores a goal or a touchdown or a basket, you can have the color of your house change with that. Now, all of this sounds ridiculous for the most part, but there are, this is the beginning of the way we can start to think about technology and where it's going. There was a time when email was quite ridiculous because people didn't trust email. They'd say the facts work so well, why would we need email? And then email came and became part of our lives. What we have to do is figure out the things that make sense for us, 
and use those and then ignore the ones that don't. So let's keep going. On our app, I told you we have to tell people about it, so we made these buttons that say start here and we put it on the floor of the Met, we put it on the website, and we ended up in places we normally are not. This is the Met between Hyperlapse, which is from Instagram, and ESPN. Not a place you'd expect a museum. And that's part of the fun that you don't have to play in only the places you're expected to play. You can play in new places. The hardest thing I did at the Met was not to make an app or make the hashtags, but to make this button and put, get permission to put it on George Washington's face. And as you can see, someone tweeted about this at a conference. I've also learned we're all in this together. Very, very important. What do I mean by that? My son saw that I was speaking at a conference, and he looked at this, at the brochure, and he looked at, pointed at the gentleman on the left and said, isn't that your biggest enemy? That's the director of the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. And I told him, we're not enemies. You know, we are working together, because we have to. The biggest rival of the Met is not museum, or not a museum or any museums. It is Candy Crush, Netflix, Life in 2015. Think about why you haven't been to a museum in the last few weeks, months, years. Because you have other things. Not because you don't like art. It's because there's too much going on. So maybe we're frenemies. Maybe we're in cooperation. But we're not enemies. And we work together. We have to. And that's what I tell universities to work together. I tell companies to work together. I tell media outlets to work together. That we're all in this together. I've also learned there's ro lots of cool stuff happening in museums, and some of this might give us ideas for the media. At the Cooper Hewitt, which is the design museum and in New York, they have, at the Smithsonian Institution, they have this pen that allows you to interact and draw and design throughout your visit, and then when you go back, you have it all recorded. So next time you come, you know what you've already seen. That's a cool idea. What is the media application of it? You can think about when you have a website, or you have a magazine or a booklet or anything. How do you make sure people can go right into where they left off? One of the best things about the Kindle app, you might know, is that you pause it on your iPhone, you pick it up on your Kindle, you pick it up on your browser, it's exactly the same page. That's a great way to think about our content. At the Brooklyn Museum, they have a cool idea. They call it the genius bar, you go in there and you say, you know, it's really cold in New York, do you have any beach photographs? And they'll give you an agenda of all beach tours that you can take at the Met, uh, at the Brooklyn Museum. It's really, and you know, I don't need to tell you this in Miami, um, I used to walk around for a goof to say, you know, in, in New York I'd say, my, my life motto is what can Brown do for you? And then I come to Miami and, you know, it's, I'm deluded by over here. But uh, what I think about is that you have to be truly global and truly local. You have to really think about that and what you're doing. In Miami, you know this. You're such an international city and you're doing so much internationally, but you have to be truly local. And here we have visitors from uh, Botswana with us, which is so wonderful. So what did we do? We learned that Twitter is blocked, Facebook is blocked, and YouTube is blocked in China. So we launched a Weiboa account, spelled W-E-I-B-O. Weiboa is a uh, platform that's like Twitter and, link, uh, and, and Facebook in China. The only major account that's not blocked in China um, platform is, anybody know? LinkedIn. Why is that? Because the Chinese government understands that LinkedIn is the best way to find multilingual speakers of uh, professionals who can work in China. So think about this. The Chinese government understands the value of LinkedIn more than most Americans, which is a problem. So we have to think about that in, in the terms of, I hope from today's talk you will go back and look at your LinkedIn and use it in better ways. I've also learned that expertise matters. Expertise is really important. In a world, I told you already, where everybody's a photographer, you stand taller if you're trained. But it's important that you are able to provide context and your experience, your wisdom, your contacts, your background all make a difference. So that's what I say to young people, young students. Don't just learn layout and design. Learn the content to go with it, right? Whenever you get a chance, minor in politics or history or um, 
any of any subject economics because that will help you as much as all the majors that you do if you're in journalism and at the Met we have something called the timeline of art history which is 7,000 years of human creativity told through 7,000 of our objects and this is two-thirds of our web traffic now and in, in a world of social media that's what counts I've also learned you have to build your own audience you can't just announce you have something and expect people to show you have to tell them and one of the things I learned that was from the PBS media shift folks who are part of this presentation here today they were posting this regularly over the last two weeks it was great to see that's how you build an audience you have to tell people so we're launching met kids and we've already launched it even though it launches in June it's already a hashtag on YouTube on Twitter etc you also have to help your audience to understand and to use your technology I call this part it's hard to shoot jellyfish and what I mean by that is at the um, very nice aquarium in Monterey Bay they tell you it's hard to shoot the jellyfish through glass they're jellyfish after all and water so they say look put away your phones we got this and they give you beautiful shots of your fish uh, so you can just share with them share them afterwards here's another art break and before we go to Q&A I want to share with you the last item here that we have to be more open to repurposing redisplaying and resurfacing our content and what does that mean? These are when people ask me, why did you leave the uh, why did you leave Columbia? Maybe it was to say the following sentence: Our 17 Van Goghs are on display for the first time in a dozen years. Our Van Goghs, our 17 Van Goghs, and the problem is that nowhere at the Met is there a sign saying 17 Van Goghs. Any other museum, there'd be a sign outside. Why? Because we're up to promote 45 other events, other exhibitions. So the lesson for all of us is that you have great stuff, but don't forget to repurpose, resurface, and redisplay what you're doing already. So I think we're going to go to Q&A, and then after that, I'll give you a couple of final thoughts. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, she's going, to, she's going to moderate. She's going to be Phil Donahue. I said that the other day, and half the room didn't know who Phil Donahue was. So sad. <laughs> Anyone know who Phil Donahue is? Thank you. Uh, a what journalist? A censored journalist, yeah. So to the young people in the room, Phil Donahue was, he didn't start as a journalist. I mean, he wasn't really famous for being a journalist. He was a talk show host. But then later on, he became a very activist journalist. Thank you so much for your, for your remarks. It's very useful. I'm Maria Elena Villan. I'm the interim chair of the Department of Advertising and Public Relations. So um, this is a topic that really brings all of us together. So I will be moderating the questions. I like to think of myself more as Oprah. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> Good point. <laughs> so um, yeah, I saw a hand up over here. Oh, you can go. Yes, my name is Michael Van Dyke. I'm a computer science teacher <coughs> at a high school here in Dade County. Um, I've been in the Metropolitan Museum dozens of times. Thank you. Uh, I understand that the Metropolitan Museum has three to four times as much stuff in storage as they do in the actual museum. What are you doing to catalog all that and put that online and make it available? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question, and it's a question that people ask of most museums because m most museums have those kinds of numbers of things that are... Uh, that are on, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to find this here, okay, that are in their storage. Now, about the Met, I will just say that the Met actually has, uh, is slightly different. We believe we show 90% of what can be shown. We have a tremendous photography collection that we cannot display because of the, um, of the uh, light sensitivity. We have 30,000 baseball cards, the largest baseball card collection outside of Cooperstown, including Ahonas Wagner. We can never show except 150 at a time. Uh, we have 1.5 million drawings and prints, including a print by a drawing by Michelangelo that we cannot show because of light. So we believe we show 90% of what we can. Many museums show 50, 30, 40% because of space. What we do have is space with the 2 million square feet. But we try to rotate out and show things. We're also trying to digitize more of the museum so that people can have it. We took 400,000 images, put it online for non-commercial use. Anybody can 
do anything they want with them to an extent, and we put them out there. We hope to do more and get more of our content to be seen by the world. Thank you. Ms. Oprah, Ms. Winfrey. Hi. Um, it's interesting you have a journalistic background, so let me just ask a question about the future. Uh, with, uh, you said journalism and isn't dead, but coming from the, the years you had as a journalism professor and what you see as tomorrow is uh, the way information is being disseminated, what do you think the, the uh, landscape is going to be with uh, as far as journalism and, and, uh, and news, the dissemination of news in the future? Thank you. That's a great question, and I would say if I knew the answer, I would be very rich because I would have predicted all kinds of things. You know, I want to go back to 1999 and put a lot of money on Google, right? I probably put money on pets.com, which blew up, as some of you know. So uh, somebody asked me in January, what, is, what are the big media trends for 2015? And I said it feels like 2006 all over again because the biggest things now are email newsletters, podcasting, and blogging. Right? That's 2006. What is different between 2006 and today is those things are much easier to do. The technology has become better. That's the only thing that's different. But life has also changed. I was talking uh, earlier about thinking about relationships in, in the world. And when I was growing up, if you didn't have Saturday evening plans by Wednesday, you were out of it, like you're a loser, and that I was very familiar with that situation. Today, today, young people don't have plans at Saturday morning. But why? Because they know by Saturday evening they will have plans, because technology makes it possible. So what we have to think of as people in media, if you're thinking about the future of journalism, is if you accept that there's more journalism being created and consumed than ever before, it's only a matter of getting it in the right places. So a couple of examples that I can give you. When, I'm with, uh, when I told you I, that I got some social media lessons from Roger Ebert, and I love Roger, and I learned so much, never having met him, I, I got all these um, ideas from watching Roger Ebert, and I never met him. I read every review he wrote, but when my wife and I had a rare date night out, we didn't go to Roger Ebert, we asked our friends on Facebook, what should we see? Because they know us better than Roger does. Similarly, when I'm standing in Times Square with my children and they're screaming, hungry, do I want at that moment a beautiful New York Times review of the best restaurant in town or do I want nearest pizza, right? I want nearest pizza what, by going on Yelp. I believe if this doesn't exist already, it should exist nearest taco, nearest, right? There should be an app like this. I'm sure there is. Uh, taco around me. There's one called around me that does things like that. So what should the New York Times be doing? It doesn't mean it shouldn't do the very good, deep reviews, but it should make sure it's also in that app where I'm looking. You know, you, you heard the saying, fish where the fish are, right? So like that's what you should be doing. You should be right in there. And we should think about taking our journalistic work or the things that are journalist, journalism and putting it where people are already there and being part of that mix. I think for too long we've been segregated into kind of our own silos. And at the Met, we were all about bringing traffic to our website. That's important for us. But now we're talking about putting our content on other people's networks. If you like the idea of the 100 videos I told you, ask us. We'll give them to you. And you can host it. They're all on YouTube. You can put them on a, with an embed code. You can put them on. Or some other way, we'll work with you if you want our 100 new videos that we're putting up. You can binge watch them like you binge watch Orange is the New Black or, uh, or, or even um, you know, House of Cards, things like that. So what's that other lesson is don't hoard everything that you're doing and decide you're going to play your cards like one at a time on your schedule. People don't care about that. When we did 82nd and 5th, we did them two a week, every week for 50 weeks. This time, we've already changed. We're doing them on, on, Wednesday, on Thursday, you'll get 20 of them. And then you'll get 20 a few months later and 20. <clears throat> so we're <clears throat> borrowing happily. You know, you don't call it copying, you call it borrowing. You call it honoring uh, the idea of binge watching for what we're doing. I believe what we do is media, journalism, type stuff. It's not journalism. I call what we do good guy advocacy. We're advocating for the arts and culture. 
Sorry, answers are too long. You'll tell me when to cut off, cut it off, please. Thank you. The world of social media is changing so fast, and um, it's hard to almost be really good at executing what's already there, and also keep on top of what's coming or the latest new thing that happened an hour ago. So, h how are you? monitoring the new channels you want to be a part of and how fast are you implementing? So like, are you using Snapchat or Vine and how are you assessing and what's kind of like the tipping point that makes you decide, okay, now, now it's hit critical volume where we really need to be part of it. And then how do you play catch up? Because it feels like by the time it's reached that tipping point, you're already sort of behind. <laughs> That's a that's good. Well, that's very scary, though, right? By the time it's hit the tipping point, you're already behind. I think that's a good way to kind of look at it. So I would I would say a couple of things about this. One is that we have to think about how it is that these things come around. Like right now, Meerkat is the app of the moment. Uh, there are other things that come and go. For example, we made a list this morning. L O E L L O. Another thing called this. Another, like there's so many things, like how do you decide? You saw a, a, a chart I put up of all the um, social networks that the Met is on, and you'll notice that Snapchat is not there. That doesn't mean Snapchat is not important, it just means that we're not ready for it yet, and it doesn't fit with our work yet. Our audience is not there yet. There is no prize for being first on almost any of these channels. That's sort of one of my uh, words of advice to you is, you don't have to be first, right? You may want to be first, but you don't have to be first. This is just loading up. So think about that. Then think about, is my audience ready? And by the way, I got a note from a curator that said, LACMA, the great museum out in LA, is joined Snapchat. When are we joining? And I nearly fell off my chair. Because Snapchat was just this thing that's totally dismissed, right? It's self-destructing, all of that stuff. And then it turns out there's now a guide, Snapchat for business. I tweeted it, Snapchat for business. I couldn't believe I was typing those words. My hands were trying to stop me from typing those words. Snapchat for business is a real thing. So you have to find, so that's on an enterprise level. For each of you individually, my guideline is, does it fit into two things, your workflow and your life flow? If it fits into your workflow, meaning it makes sense as for work, you'll use it, but you will only really use it if it fits into your life flow. The real thing is what we should have done in 1998, 99, 2000, when the BlackBerry came around. That was when things really changed in, in the world, when your bosses now email you at 11 at night and expect an answer at 11.30, right? Before, with email, maybe they thought you didn't have email at home, maybe you <laughs> and you would email somebody at six o'clock and you wouldn't expect an answer till nine. Now what happens? People are emailing you back in the morning. Like first thing you wake up, you're checking your email, you're responding. That's when we should have all said no. It's too late now. That's when the overlords have taken over, right? I mean, that's sort of the problem. Hello. Hi. Hello, my name is Andrew Quarry, and uh, I'm the founder of Journid, uh, basically a platform that connects journalists, freelancers, uh, with uh, newsrooms and also brands. Uh, you spoke earlier about, you know, working in silos, you know, tra traditional journalists working in silos uh, as opposed to those who are CDOs and are in, in social media who are managers of community. What do you think about the, you know, the, the, the question of ethics that I always hear that pop up about those who are doing what we call brand journalism these days? How do you give permission to up and coming, you know, students who are going to be going into the world where they need to use their skill sets in so many different areas, how do you give them permission to go ahead and go forward uh, you know, to the dark side as it's branded at times. Uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Well, well, I'm not the one to give permission anymore <laughs> since I'm not a professor of journalism anymore, but I had to wrestle with that myself. I loved every minute of being a journalist full-time, being a professor full-time. It was the greatest thing in my life. I learned it all. I learned everything I am I owe to journalism. I told my parents when I was 12 I was going to be a journalist. They started crying immediately. <laughs> Indian parents, right, they want a doctor, a lawyer, you know, things like that. A doctor, engineer, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, but I knew this is, journalism is awesome and I want to be in it. That's all, that's all I knew. And I would encourage all of you to kind of think about what you have as journalists. Journalism is still awesome. You have to decide what role you're going to play in it. 
One of your colleagues, one of the students in a workshop today said, I have the word journalist in my, bio, in my Twitter handle. You know, I, should I keep that? And a word about just putting whatever you want on your Twitter handle, unless your company forces you at gunpoint to put your company name in your handle, don't do it. Somebody on Twitter said it's like putting your boyfriend's name, tattooing your boyfriend's name on your arm. There's a good chance it'll work out, but there's a good chance it may not work out. So, she, so that was a slight tangent to talk about handles. But what I said to her as a journalist is, if you know you're going to be a journalist, that's great. But if you're not going to be a journalist, the skill sets of journalists are so much in demand now. And there are ways in which you can use that for good or for dark or for kind of the bad side of things. And one way to do it is to think about, you know, you want to be uh, a good guy advocacy person, like what I said, working for nonprofits. I had a student who um, chose to work for a big na uh, environmental agency instead of working for, uh, in journalism, even though he had all these credentials as a journalist. He said he was doing better, full, better real journalism by working for this environmental organization than he was writing one story every two weeks about the environment. And he said he was freed from this amazing thing that you have in journalism, that for every story about the environment, he had to find somebody who denied climate science, right, climate change. He had to go and find them for every story. And he said, not every story deserves a but on the other hand. And that was something that was interesting to kind of see. So I would say to your, uh, to, stu to young people, Journalism is wonderful. I hope you will go in it, and I hope you will do well in it. Uh, but if you have a passion to tell a story, there are so many ways in which you can do that that are not only journalism. I believe I will always have be a journalist at heart, but I'm now open to other ideas. But journalism is awesome. I want to make that I'll underline the awesome part. I, I have a question from an educator's perspective. Sure. Um, what what skills you know basic fundamental skills do you should we be teaching right at the <coughs> college level when we're training communicators to be good at this to be good at social media to know how to use it strategically to achieve what they're trying to achieve I think you the answer is right there strategic like how do you do this in a strategic manner another word I love and I'm obsessed about right now is <coughs> is intentionality are you doing things with an intention if your intention is to get more people to follow you, why do you want more people to follow you? And why should they follow you? What are they going to get by following you? What are you going to post that's interesting that will be of interest for, for them to see? So be intentional in the, in the kind of stuff you're posting uh, is, is a way to think about uh, social. But as, as educators, I would urge you, and I know you're doing all, this, all the right things because I spent two hours with students earlier today, and I learned things from talking to them. But make them, uh, there's, a, there's a term that was coined by my uh, former colleague, Sig Gisler, who I mentioned earlier. And he coined this term, the tradigital journalist. Tradigital, traditional and digital. That means you're traditional in values, traditional in um, skills, traditional in uh, the ethics of journalism, but you have a digital overlay that you understand audience, you understand metrics, you understand social, you understand mobile. And if you can blend those two, you will always have work. If you don't, if you're only about the digital without the traditional, then I think you're going to have trouble. So I would urge you to continue to do what you're doing, but emphasize that combination of the digital and the social. And when I think about what are the technologies that are going to be around for a long time, I think about digital, local, mobile, video. These are all things that we should be doing. We should be taking more pictures as you're seeing things, posting them. It's really important to practice with your camera when you don't need it so that you can be there when you need it. And there are the deans taking a picture of all of you. That's great. So you should always be thinking about that as well. Hi, Shri, Liz Bayo Matthews, Hi. former How student of yours at Columbia. Yes. How are you? Um, so for those of us who experienced the Met prior to you taking on this role, we can see that there's been a very proactive way of presenting the Met to the world now. What are some of the hurdles that you encountered in getting everybody else to buy in into this new technology and this new way of doing business? 
you want me to keep my job and you're asking me this on camera in front of everybody with a recording? No, thank you. First of all, Liz, great to see you. And a lesson for all of you is among thousands and thousands of students I've had at, at Columbia, I remember Liz, we've been in touch. You have to stand out in the crowd and you stand out in the crowd by getting to know your professors, delivering great work. It's not about schmoozing your professors. The number one way to schmooze is to deliver great work. And then after that, get to know them, not friending them on Facebook, but getting to know them and them getting to know you. So the question was about, um, about the Met. And I should say, the Met has had digital long before I got there and long after I leave, and they're doing wonderful work. Uh, sometimes it just takes an outsider to just kind of directionally show things. But again, I have not done all of this. This is the Met has done it. Uh, in terms of when I joined the Met, someone said to me, you'll have a really hard time getting a hundred curators to do things, uh, to try new things. The good news is that you don't want a hundred people to do things. Because if they had all said, I'm going to do something new, I'd be drowned and not able to come and visit Miami like this. What has helped is that you work, and this is, I'm, I'm going to talk about in a context of your companies. Whatever company you're in, think about how you can make changes by being an agent of change, and being an agent of change means working with the people who want to do things. You don't have to drag everybody across the finish line or anything. And in the Met, by the way, there is no finish line. This is going to be around forever. One of the things I learned differently, by the way, than, uh, than anything I'd ever thought was how people think in time, right? At, at the university, the semester is how we think. In businesses, quarters or days or things like that. But um, here, at the Met, they think in decades and centuries. And that's because they know what they're doing is not trying to make some kind of quarterly profit. They're trying to keep the museum going for the next, the next 100 years, right? That's what they're trying to do. So um, all my invitations are coming. Uh, so that's, that's been very, it's kind of calming to know that you don't have to deliver something tomorrow all the time. Pick the things you can do, and you don't also have to, I would say to all of you in your businesses, everything doesn't have to be a grand slam, right? I can talk baseball in Miami because everybody knows baseball. It doesn't have to be a grand slam. There is value in singles and doubles. And if you really know your baseball, right, um, you know, I was, I'm a big fan of, uh, I was born in Japan, by the way. My dad had no problem picking me out in the window. He said, the brown one is mine. <laughs> and. And so I love Japanese baseball players who are in America. I don't know any of them in Japan. But if you uh, think of Hideki Matsui, was one of my favorite players. He was a slugger. He did huge home runs, right? But then Ichiro Suzuki came to the Yankees, and I started watching him. And then you see a real value in somebody who hits singles and then turns those singles into doubles every time he goes up there, right? So what can we do? I think a lot of young people think we have to hit grand slams. But what can we do to hit more singles, stretch them into doubles, stretch them into triples, and more importantly, also occasionally learn to take a walk, right? Take a walk. And also, if you strike out, it's OK. One of the main reasons why people have trouble on social is they do so few tweets that every tweet is fraught with danger, <laughs> right? So if you tweet once in every three days, that tweet has a lot of pressure on it, and it's going to explode. But if you tweet four times a day, You'll make a mistake, but it's not so bad. And that's what I would, I would think about as well. And since I'm talking baseball, I'll just make one more thing about journalism that I want to say to all of you. I worked, um, I was involved with, and I worked on a startup, a hyper-local news startup in New York called DNA Info. And it's both in New York as well as in Chicago. You don't want to read this story right now. You don't want to visit New York. <laughs> Let's see if we can find a better story than that. Um, anyway, you get the picture. Well, it's New York. You actually, did anybody not expect that story to be the lead story when you see a New York site? Nobody, right? You all expected it to be something like this. But anyway, um, let's see what's it in Chicago. Anyway, this is a site that has um, uh, 80 journalists or something, and they have a radio station. They've got all kinds of uh, things going on. And I'm very proud to have helped put the business plan together. And I learned so much doing this project, hyperlocal news. And what I used to say to people, especially this was, we launched this in January of 2009. 
when the economy was so bad and things were so terrible. And um, this is funded by the other billionaire from Omaha, and a gentleman named Joe Ricketts. And people would say to me, how can you do that? Like, what is your answer for, is this going to solve all the problems in journalism? And I said, absolutely not. This was just our attempt. You know, it is, I like to think, especially that time in January of 09, it was, everybody thought it was like the bottom of the ninth and you have one strike left. And that's not true. It wasn't true then, it's not true now. It was like more like the seventh inning and you're down by two runs and you have a, ch you have a chance to bat. Do you take a swing? Meaning, do you try something or do you just sit around complaining all day that journalism is dying? And this was our attempt to take a swing. It's now still here six years later, 80 journalists are employed. How long all of that lasts? Nobody knows, right? But this is what we should all be thinking about. What can we do in journalism, in media today? The great news is that you can build a brand today in weeks and months instead of years. I have a chart that I like to show that it says it took television 50 years, sorry, 75 years for radio to hit the first 50 million users. Angry Birds Space took 35 days to hit 50 million users. Right? That's how the world has changed. So it's all about what do you bring to the table? What new idea, what problem are you solving? And you don't need to be 50 million users to be successful anymore. That's also the good news. Uh, I, just, I just wanted you to expound a little bit about your point on LinkedIn and how our students should be using LinkedIn um, for their career track. Thank you. So LinkedIn, as I said, is vastly um, misunderstood and underutilized. And I'd love for you all to sign up on LinkedIn, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, three things you can do today on LinkedIn that will help you tomorrow. First is use it. Second is fix a couple of things. Go into your LinkedIn and change your headline in LinkedIn. I tell people you are better than your you're, you're, you are better than your title, whatever your title, even dean of the FIU journalism school, you're better than your title. So have something aspirational or what it is you do and then have your title in the headline. The summary is a beautiful place for you to tell your aspirational story and the reality of who you are, both in one place. And then the rest of it is facts. Another thing you can do today is book and reserve your customized LinkedIn URL. How many of you have done that? A few of you, right? Everybody should do this. I believe all that freshmen in high school, not even college, should be taught how to use LinkedIn. Build your skills on LinkedIn, the list of skills, but please don't worry about those endorsements. They're the worst part of LinkedIn. You know what I'm talking about, where everybody's endorsing each other? It's a total waste of time. But the recommendations, super useful on LinkedIn. So you've got to pick which ones you want to do and do, do that one that way. So those are some quick LinkedIn things. Practice and use it. And then when you ask for recommendations when you don't need them, so that they're there when you need them. And when a boss says something nice about you, make a note of it. If they send you an article, if they write you something, just clip it and save it and then when you're leaving the company, ask if they will give you a, a LinkedIn recommendation, your bosses, your professors, et cetera. But we did learn earlier today that some of you, Moses especially, Professor Moses doesn't accept LinkedIn requests until they are done with the course. Professor Reisner waits till they graduate. Those are two completely acceptable and recommended strategies, but they have them. That's the main thing. They're being intentional about them rather than just whatever comes and goes, so that's good. Do okay, so we'll take one last question sure. before we... And then I'll give you a final thought before the reception. So. We've come pretty far already with journalism since, say, 2000, but where do you think this technology will be like, say, 20 years from now? All right, so there's another prediction question, which I'm really bad at. Um, I will say journalism, it will... Sorry. Uh, sorry. This was... While, while this is going on here. Um, okay, remember we told you to take pictures, so we're gonna practice that now as the last thing and I'm gonna answer your question. I'm gonna throw up, uh, no, I'm gonna throw up, I'm gonna throw on the screen here. <laughs> now that would be something, right? Now, if I wanted your attention, that'd be something. Okay, so I'm gonna throw on the screen here 
everything I know about social media in 52 seconds. Let's see if you can take pictures of the slides and you have them for yourself. And this is an app called Five Slides App, which only allows you to make five slides at a time, and you have to make them on your phone. So that's how I did this presentation. So you can do this on your phone here. So I'm just going to hit this play, and then you can take pictures. And these are the questions you should ask yourself. Is your social media optimized? Oops. Shall I do that? I'll give you one more chance. We'll just go back. Who follows who follows you? Meaning it's not important who follows you, but who follows who follows you. And are you tracking new ideas? And there you have my Twitter handle. My email address is sri at sri.net, not sri.com, as I told you. And we're just going to go through this here so that you can um, get these. So each of these slides are going to come through, and you're going to take a picture for yourself, and you're going to have them. And then we're going to do my social media success formula all in the next two minutes. All right, so you want to grab a picture of this really quickly? All right, you're all doing this. Thank you. We're going to go to the next one. If you don't know what triangulate is, take a picture of it and try it at home. Raw counts mean nothing, it says. Here are all the new tools I'm using, including if this, then that. Someone asked about that. There is time hop, and there's everything else. All right. Now, let me answer his question, which is a very good question, and give you my social media success formula. And then we're done. Is that okay? All right. So the question was about the future. And I don't know, is what I can say. I subscribe to a print daily newspaper. And Margaret Sullivan, who is the ombudsman of the New York Times, just wrote a beautiful column about who pays for print today and that I urge you all to read. It's in my Twitter feed. You can go back and read it. But please do look at it. And one of her lines in it was, some of my best friends are octogenarians and their elder brothers, which was hilarious and, and self-mocking. But it was also, I believe in print, and I believe that print will be around for a while. Is it going to be 20 years? I don't know. But I believe that the skills of journalism, the tools of journalism, are always going to be around. The work you do in taking a situation, analyzing it, and then giving context is, will always be here. And I'm so bullish about this that I believe that there is real value in people studying journalism and getting better at it, getting smarter at it. One of my students graduated four years ago from grad school, came from Idaho, and he started a, tool, a website called Contently, which some of you may have seen, Content LY. Take a look. And he's got... Um, 50,000 freelancers working for him. That's not a typo. 50,000 freelancers doing stories for and about brands. And that goes to some of the things that we heard earlier. But he's doing it, right? He's trying something new. But the skills of a journalist will always be around. So I'm sorry that's not the best answer that I could have given you, but it was what I know so far. Now I'm going to give you my success formula. We're going to pretend we're in a Catholic church on Sunday led by a Hindu priest. So it's a weird, like, you know, uh, uh, situation, but it's Miami. I guess anything goes, right? So we're going to say these words together to learn them. So you're going to take a picture of them, and then we're going to say these words together. Are you ready to do this? Are you ready? Yes. yes. Hallelujah. You've got to be loud, okay? Someone said that's more like a Baptist priest than a Catholic <laughs> priest. Like, what are you doing? I don't know. I don't know. All right. Okay, here we go. We're going to say these loudly together, okay? And start with the word helpful. Louder. Kindly. I can't hear you. Sing it, sister. Sing it, brother. Take me home, brother. Hallelujah. Amen. There you go. So all your posts don't have to be all these things all the time, but all your posts should be some of these things. Go back to that word intentionality. And as you heard, the first slide I showed you said, the scarcest resource of the 21st century is human attention. And you gave me an hour and a half of your attention. Didn't move from your seats. I'm so grateful. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you in New York. Once again, uh, let's thank our presenter. Sri 
I have to say it wasn't too hard, I hope, convincing you to come from New York to Miami in March. But also, I wanted to thank the Hearst Committee for the hard work putting together this event, and also our technical staff, our staff in the office, everybody who was involved in putting this together, and the PBS Media Shift, uh, people who are tweeting and webcasting this event. So thank you very much. And thank you all for the insightful questions. I hope you're leaving here with a lot of good ideas and ready to implement this whole strategy. So thank you for being here. Please join us for some refreshments here. And you'll get a chance of talking to Sharia a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.